Good evening and welcome to the 386th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. This is a weekly lecture series on comics, animation, yes, illustration, and other text image work. It's unmuted. It's uh, funded in part by the Will and Ann Eisner Family Foundation. And our guest tonight is Peter Blegvad. Um, just trying to mute somebody. I uh, Peter's born in New York, lives in London. He's known. He's the perfect text and image practitioner and music practitioner since the mid seventies. He was writing songs and performing music with uh, Slap Happy, Faust, Henry Cow, John Greaves, the Golden Palominos, John Zorn. Andy Partridge and others. Uh, he created dozens of ear tunes or audio cartoons and several radio plays for BBC Radio 3. His comic strip, The Book of Leviathan, was collected and published in the UK by Sort of Books and in the US by Overlook Press. In 2000, he was awarded the Order de la Grande Jidou. Jidoui, uh, s'il vous plaît. Jidoui, by the uh, Collège de Pédophysique right. in Paris. And in 2011, he was elected president of the London Institute of Pathophysics. And mm -hmm. he's here tonight to talk about his new book, uh, Milk Through a Glass Darkly. So welcome, Peter. Thanks, Ben. Nice to be here. Hello, everybody. Um, so this is a very loose kind of thing I've thrown together. I'm using slides as sort of a stepping stone, stepping stones that I can follow. And hopefully I'll be able to come up with something to say about each slide that will link to the preceding slide and there'll be some semblance of order to it, but I wouldn't bet on it. Um, uh, the first image here is the cover of the book. Seemed reasonable to start like that. Um, it's published by Uniform Books, which is run by Colin Sackett in the town of Axminster. It's a 94-page book, a slim volume, fits handily into the pocket of most jackets, and it consists of 342 quotes collected over 50 years. And when I say collected, um, it's true. I went to libraries and looked up milk in their card catalogs and um, did, in fact, uh, acquire quite a library of books to do with milk. But most of the quotes, and certainly all my favorites, were acquired by chance, sort of passively amassed and added to the collection. And when you when you find something by chance, of course, it has a kind of oracular mystique. And I was very interested in that. that uh, that's sort of how to cultivate an obsession. Um, you have to be extremely patient or extremely idle. And I was both of those things. Um, so yeah, as early as 1977, I already had a voluminous collection of quotes and pictures that pertained sometimes were only obliquely to the subject of milk. And as Sophie Cow says, objects always meet your obsession. Once you have an obsession, you step on it at every corner. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that syndrome. It's a wonderful thing, though. It gives structure to what sometimes can seem like a formless, dangerously vertiginous and formless life. Certainly, um, when I began my collection, it was partly in, in reaction to the anxiety I felt at the lack of structure and direction in my life. Um, and in a, in a way, this, this collection, which wasn't really a conscious collection, I sort of did it idly, as I say. Um, it gave me a, a, something to hold on to. Um, and here's a, a sample of some of the books in my library to do with milk. Um, most of them are of no interest to me whatsoever because they only treat of the facts 
to do with milk and I'm not very interested in all the facts. I mean, I'm sort of interested, but I'm looking for something else. Um, now, I would like not to see us. I would like to see the, this. Okay, that's better. So yeah, the form of, of the text in the book, I think of it as a poem, um, a sort of epic poem about milk. Um, and the poetic form is the cento, in which a poem emerges from a collage of quotations, each of them unchanged in itself, but profoundly altered by the compiler's selection, the harmony and dissonance produced by the repetitions and sequencing. I mean, 50 years I was collecting these quotes and just throwing them into a box or several boxes and, and not really thinking about them too much. And in the back of my mind, I always had the model of um, a book I would I would write, a book in my own words, which would occasionally quote from some of this material. But, you know, I would have to write the damn thing. And it took me 50 years to look at the quotes and say, no, I don't have to write anything. The quotes themselves are the book. And it's much better than it could be if I'd written it. Um, to give you an example, this is page one, and this is how it appears in the book. The quotes are numbered, but there's no um, credit, no acknowledgement uh, of the source. So, you know, one is marvelously many materials make milk, much too many to mention. You can't imagine how much milk is in a glass of milk. The glass corresponds to the unum vas of alchemy and its contents to the living semi-organic mixture from which the lapis endowed with spirit and life will emerge. Its cylindricality makes it phallic while its hollowness makes it uterine. I put a light in the milk. You mean a spotlight on it? No, I put a light right inside the glass because I wanted it to be luminous. In a hollow, rounded space it ended with a luminous lamp within suspended. What does light do specifically to milk? In a matter of minutes, it destroys vitamins A, C, and B2, accelerates oxidation of fatty matter, and causes the distinctly unpleasant sensations known as oxide taste or fishy taste or metallic flavor. So I think just from this example, you can see kind of the, the structural strategy at work um, with this. The quotes connect, but sometimes it's a very tenuous connection, and sometimes they lead off in um, strange uh, detours, directions. Um, giving you uh, the sources of that, that page one, marvelously many materials comes from Lewis Carroll. You can't imagine how much milk is in a glass of milk is something Tammy Faye Backer, if any of you remember her, said when her husband, the disgraced evangelist, um, uh, he, he was sentenced to, I don't know how many years for his transgressions, and he suffered from digestive problems, and all he could eat was milk. He could drink milk. Um, and the glass corresponding to this alchemical vessel is Jung, I put a light in the milk. You mean a spotlight on it? That's a famous quote, Hitchcock talking to Francois Truffaut. And in a hollow rounded space, it ended with a luminous lamp within suspended. Edward Lear, the dong with the luminous nose. So you can see um, how you're, you're looking for connections, but um, you cover a vast range, the whole history of literature is covered and I'm, I'm exaggerating slightly, but um, you know, you do cover a lot of ground. Um, I'll, I'll go on for a bit. Neither young nor old, neither modern nor old fashioned, neither the pupil nor the boy, neither mature nor immature. I was neither this nor that. I was nothing. I know what nothing means and keep on playing. When the new center of personal energy has been subconsciously incubated so long as to be just ready to open into flower, 
hands off is the only word for us. It must burst forth unaided. There's your new life blasted with milk. Beginning and end of the process conjoin in milk, which dissolves in weakness the old physical man and coagulates in wisdom the new spiritual man. And the vessel in which this spiritual birth takes place appears as a magic vessel and as a vessel of transformation. The iced glass is a light. It disappears tonight. In what condition is this metamorphosis completed? Not in the bright, clearly distinguishing light, but in the night, which causes the contours of things to disappear. Truth, like milk, arrives in the dark, phosphorescent from all its encounters with darkness. Truth, the milk of the cow, if the cow itself fed on that milk. My idea was to create a general atmosphere of obscurity so as to ensure that only the object would give off light and that it would appear like a vision. I wanted to give the same effect that you get when you're in a wood and you see a butterfly. Look upward, neither firm nor free, purposeless matter hovers in the dark. Through the little hole of his wound, the immense realm of spirit enters. It has been compared with a mouth. It has a message. I understood that the object contained a message for me and I should decipher it. So as you see, it comes from a vast range of sources, but there is a kind of connection that leads the reader through wandering through this kind of, uh, yeah, navigation. Um, I've treated the subject of milk over the years in many different forms. Um, I, I haven't actually written a book about milk, but I've written articles about it and I've done sort of uh, picture stories, to use Ben's term, um, about it. And this is an excerpt from one where I try to explain a question everybody asks me. You know, why did you choose milk? Well, I didn't. Milk chose me, splash. And it all started with this book. I put a light in the milk. You mean a spotlight on it? No. I put a light right inside the glass because I wanted it to be luminous. And I say in this um, illustration, if I could read it, uh, qu quotes flew out of books, lured to the glow, summoned by association. Yes, well, it's true. Once you, as, as Sophie Kyle said, once you have the obsession, you see connections to it everywhere. So milk became a kind of magnet um, and I just kept accumulating stuff. Uh, let's see here. Uh, beautifully written by hand here. <laughs> when Hitchcock put a light in the glass because I wanted the audience to think it was poisonous, he produced a kind of anti-light with properties normally associated with darkness, a cold, wet, colorless light which hid more than it made visible. This would not have been the case had the glass contained any other liquid, even such association-rich fluids as wine, blood, oil, ink, or water. In Cocteau's film Orphée, Jean Marais takes dictation from the radio in Death's Rolls Royce. One of the enigmatic transmissions he received is the phrase, a, a single glass of water lights the world. A world lit by H2O would be a daylight world of sparkling clarities at the opposite end of the spectrum from the world lit by milk's tenebrific moon a world populated by immature Pierrots seeking immersion, a second birth. So already you can probably see from some of, some of those quotes and from this that a theme is emerging. So milk, because of its association with childhood um, and with birth and all that, um, you know, many of us require more than one birth. And that became a very 
powerful theme in this book. So yeah, the uncanny, I think the book seeks to make, um, I, I think of milk as an uncanny substance already. It is uncanny, um, but I want the reader to get a sense of, of that sense. Um, and Sigmund Freud's definition of the uncanny, the return of a familiar thing made strange by repression. Well, this raises the interesting question, what is it about milk that we feel needs to be repressed? Um, you know, something that fr frightens us um, or makes us uncomfortable, unheimlich. Um, well, I like this definition of poetry Mick Imla gave. Oh, poetry is a way of talking about things that frighten you. Um, so that was another way I was interested in um, getting milk to... Uh, to sort of talk about itself. I didn't want to talk about milk. I wanted to hear what other people had to say about milk. And it was as if I was interviewing the substance itself. Um, and so transgression is at the heart of this whole thing. Um, immature it. Why is it missing the letter Y? I didn't do that on purpose, but I could make up a reason. Um, yeah, so immaturity. Uh, of course, Peter Pan is the icon of immaturity. How do I get rid of this pictures of these lovely people? Um, yeah, while turning 18 might be when we legally become an adult, with reaching 21 seen as significant in terms of coming of age, the study that this was about shows that in 2011, we don't actually feel like grown-ups until the ripe old age of 28. A third admit they don't think they'll ever really feel like a proper grown-up, even when they have kids of their own. Right. Well, one of the transgressive things that might surface in a study like this is, you know, why do you want to grow up? Um, how transgressive is it to be immature? How unforgivable a sin is it to be? You know, I felt terribly... Um, guilty about it for many, many years, because I realized I was incredibly immature. But I think I'm now 72. Yeah, I think it was last spring. I, I began to think, yeah, I don't I don't think I'm immature. Anymore. Well, not in the same way, anyway. Um, yeah, there's something so transgressive about this image. It just, it's up, upsetting. And it costs $350. And there's this phenomenon of the adult baby. These are people who are not ashamed to admit and to, in fact, they gather together, they spend enormous sums of money on gigantic cribs and high chairs with extra room in the seat, a $700 playpen and other accoutrements. We also sell big baby accessories and clothing, fun, simple, and sophisticated, crib bedding and rocking horses built to last. Well, they would have to be. Um, you know, it's funny and tragic at the same time. I've always liked that mixture. Um, back to Hitchcock. Uh, these are stills from Suspicion, his film in which Cary Grant carries the famous glass with the light in it upstairs, ostensibly to poison his wife. Um, and uh, yes, there and in that state, the glass is a pool, says Wallace Stevens. Return to a place lit by a glass of milk was the title of a collection of poems by Charles Simic. And that quote I've already read to you, the glass corresponds to the unum vas of alchemy. Oops, here we go, there we are. Uh, yes, yeah, so this was a monotype I did in 1974 of what it might look like inside the milk bar. There's the milk bar itself from the outside. The white stuff is what's being served within. But how white is white? That's a question. Um, yeah, as soon as something's white, it's calling to its opposite and evokes the opposite. It can't be white by itself. Um, yeah. Now I have to move this again. 
there must be a button I can hit to make it disappear, but I don't know where it is. Yeah, white has a peculiar twofold quality. It has the purity of the innocent who have not yet lived and the emptiness of the dead for whom life is over. White is completeness and nothingness, as complete and empty as the circle, says Rudolf Arnheim. Well, this sort of stroboscopic flicker between black and white, between contraries, um, is at the heart of any real obsession. I mean, if you're, if you're going to de develop an obsession, it would be a good idea to, see, to recognize the dialectic that operates within them. Um, yes, the Great Mother was a wonderful source that everybody I knew was reading back in the 70s in New York in the downtown scene, which was very much led by the females in our company. I, I was, you know, I learned a lot from the males I knew, but it was really the, the women who seemed to have the most to teach. And The Great Mother was one of the books I was turned on to at that time. And I always loved this diagram. That's The Great Mother herself um, in the middle there as a great vessel and um, there are three levels to it, the underworld below her, then there's the terrestrial world in the middle, and a kind of mythical world at the top. And you can see that um, her left breast leads to milk, which leads to wisdom. And I think I must have added glass as an extension of the grail. Because yeah, there's something about the glass of milk but um, the book by Eric Neumann um, also treats of the dialectic. Um, Neumann discerns a universal experience of the maternal as a dual source of life support and fear, an experience rooted in the dialectical relation of growing consciousness symbolized by the child to the unconscious and the unknown symbolized by the great mother. So, yeah, you have to be respectful. Yeah, this is an interesting cover for Time magazine. Are you mom enough? Are you a great mother enough? Um, and quote number 305 in, the, in, in my book, um, if you're a parent with young children, you've likely encountered a sanctimommy. Sanctimommies are that modern species of sanctimonious mothers who liberally dispense parenting advice laced with the subtext, I'm not saying you're a bad parent, but smug in their maternal superiority, they crusade perhaps most vehemently against moms who choose not to breastfeed. I don't know what their attitude is to moms who continue to breastfeed even when their kids are grown up. Um, Here's a poem by Rita Dove, which also has this dialectic about the mother being fearsome as well as protective. Who can forget the attitude of mothering? Toss me a baby and without bothering to blink, I'll catch her, sling him on a hip. Any woman knows the remedy for grief is being needed. Duty bugles and will climb out of exhaustion every time bear the nipple or tuck in the sheet, heat milk and hum at bedside until they can dress themselves and rise, primed for love or glory. Those one-way mirrors girls peer into as their fledgling heroes slip through, storming the smoky battlefield. So when this kind woman approached at the urging of her bouquet of daughters, one for each of the world's corners, one for each of the winds to scatter, and offered up her only male child for nursing, a smattering of flesh, noisy and ordinary. I put aside the lavish trousseau of the mourner for the daintier comfort of pity. I decided to save him. Each night, I laid him on the smoldering embers, sealing his juices in slowly, so he might be cured to perfection. Oh, I know it looked damning. At the hearth, a muttering crone bent over a baby sizzling on a spit 
as neat as a Virginia ham. Poor human to scream like that, to make me remember. You know, so there's a kind of rage in it as well as a tenderness. It's a wonderful thing. And of course, it's 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 about um, you know, the Greek myth, the, the Greek myth of um, Persephone uh, being stolen away from her mom and taken to the underworld. Um, anyway, that's Rita Dub. Uh, yeah, so the breast too, you know, has the power to nourish infants or allegorically an entire community. But the bad breast is an agent of enticement and even aggression, says Marilyn Yalom in the history of the breast. Imagining is often desire's revenge on an object. We tend to imagine the object's properties reversed, a negative of the positive image we observe. The great phenomenologist of the imagination, Gaston Bachelard, believed that contradictions are the essential principle of aesthetic life. Every value evokes its opposite and is in constant struggle with it. Images like humid fire and black milk are expressions of the continuous tensions within a substance. It is by virtue of the dialectic of opposite qualities that poetic matter fascinates us. It is not absurd to speak of the blackness of milk if one feels that white becomes white by repulsing darkness. And of course, milk itself has this dialectical reputation. Um, is it a perfect food or is it poison? Because for many years before milk was uh, purified by various techniques, and, you know, it was the perfect carrier of disease. And um, as Ben Catchor treats beautifully in his book on the dairy restaurants, you know, there were terrible crimes committed by uh, dairies who would feed their cattle on slops from distilleries, which had no nourishing value at all. And the milk the cows produced was um, a sort of watery blue a liquid that they had to adulterate with paint to make it look white. And then, you know, people would trust it, buy it, feed it to their children, and their children would die. I mean, it's, you know, quite a crime. Um, the imagination has had a good time treating milk, and that's what my book really, that's, that's what I was looking for when I was collecting these quotes. I was never happier when I found some some way of hallucinating milk that I would never have dreamt of. Um, so Gregory Corso, you know, he has this poem called Food, Wisconsin provisions, insufficient when I have absolute dairy visions, corduroy eggs, owl cheese, pipe butter, firing squad milk. So that's what milk would look like, a glass of milk after it has faced the firing squad. So when collecting these quotes, you know, and I'm always thinking, well, I'm doing research for a book. I don't know what form the book will take. And <clears throat> I would lie there in my bath of milk and I'd realize, well, I'm not really interested in milk. My subject must be something else. Uh, initiation was one very likely uh, subject, uh, the second birth we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. Yes, beer is nourishing. Um, here's a mother who drinks lots of beer and has a happy, healthy baby. But on the right, there's a woman who, uh, she doesn't drink enough beer and her child's paying the price. Um, outside of you, Mickey, that milk is the best thing in the world. Inside of you, Minnie, my milk is the best thing in the world. Well, I, you know, these things are transgressive without meaning to be. Drink more milk like Popeye's muscle. Yeah, nice, nice painting. 
Um, yeah, this is pretty transgressive. Artists, male artists, of course, they love treating this subject. And this is called, um, what is it called? Roman charity. And it's based on a myth about a father who was arrested for his uh, anti-establishment um, politics, thrown in jail and sentenced to starve to death. Well, his daughter snuck into jail and kept him alive, feeding him. And yes, as I say, any number of painters thought, oh yeah, I'll, I'll paint that. And photographers to this very day find it irresistible. Um, the ecclesiastical uh, artists also, you know, St. Bernard, um, he was famously fed from the virgin's breast, but I think it's pretty clear this was symbolizing, um, you know, religion, religious faith. Um, but other cultures also have similar things. This is Ha Par Villa, extraordinary theme park in Singapore which contains over a thousand statues and giant dioramas depicting scenes from Chinese literature, folklore, legends, history, statuary of key Chinese religions. And yeah, in this case, um, it was a grandmother who was kept alive by a granddaughter. And then it happens in real life too. Um, these were people, uh, in a boat that went adrift, as so many boats go, go adrift these days too. And the people in the boat trying to escape their horrible lives um, were starving to death. But this woman, Faustina Mercedes, breastfed all 16 passengers and they survived. Here is um, an ex Libris drawing. Um, that's 1930, so pre-Nazi. But uh, yeah, the Nazis have quite a few uh, milk images too that I'm not including in this. They're, they're, not, they're not as good as this one. Don't, yeah, avoid alcohol and drink milk. Um, sure, fill her up. This is a wonderful image. God knows what it was helping to, to advertise. I always drink it. It's something I like to do. I want to be loved by the mothers. Don't we all, pal? Here's a good one. Cut out the middleman. Milk, you still think it's natural? Well, um, let's define natural. Um, this is a scene from Icelandic mythology the primordial giant sustained by the milk of this sacred cow. The Easter Bunny by René French. You know, because there is something about bodily fluids which have that um, abject quality. They are of us, but they are not us. So, you know, milk, it's got this sort of liminal status, which is kind of unsettling. Yeah, um, it was great fun to find images that I could caption um, with my own ideas. So this photograph of sterile tubes of test milk under interrogation. After the convulsions come the calms, shown here bombarded by projections of fear and desire, milk separates into constituent milks, weird glues, ectoplasms, photosensitive emulsions, inseminating and remedial agents, and reveals its secret blackness. And of course, on the right there is a medium vomiting ectoplasm. And of course, ectoplasm is closely related to milk. Um, one of the ways I used these quotes uh, many years ago was in lyrics, which I wrote for a band called The Lodge. And um, I did these sort of, they were like cut-ups where I could just sort of take bits from each quote and then combine them to make new sentences, which were um, then sung and performed. There's a photograph of The Lodge in 1988, my brother Christopher, Jacko, John Greaves, and myself um, wearing our 
large accoutrements with scarves in the background by Kiki Smith. Thank you, Kiki. Um, yeah, here's an example. I mean, on the left, uh, the quotes, the whole quote um, numbered and with the um, uh, credits given separately, which is a, the same way I, I used in my book. But you can see, I just took the word best from number nine and then a few words from number 10 and combined them to make these sort of, yeah, these strange pronouncements like best when men mix to be the one unmixed, neat, undiluted. What gladness to flee the world into a new world made largely with the intellect amid the ravishing lucidity there things that can be and cannot be get well churned together. Well, it makes sense. And I would not have thought to write that except for the constraint. Constraints liberate. Um, yeah, so the whole thing about immaturity and children and mothers, you know, there's ways that, that the, the normal roles, the cultural roles normally assigned to those um, can be reversed or played with. You know, the mother feeds the child. Well, here's the children are eating the mother. Um, here, the child is carrying the swaddled mother with a pacifier in her mouth. Uh, this is from another, uh, an American cartoonist you might remember, Lib Kleiban, Kleiban, with a quote from the Bible. Everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Oops. And there's the babe. If babies are innocent, it is not for lack of will to harm, but for lack of strength. So you better look out. I always think of Loudon Wainwright's song, Be careful, there's a baby in the house. Here's Lois Lane has found a way of making Superman regress to infancy. Every woman's dream, obviously. Um, so she can, yeah, she just uses him to commit crimes and things, or maybe solve crimes. The re Lois Lane's revenge on Superman cracks me up. Well, then there's Lois Lane. Um, she is forced to regress, baby Lois Lane. Um, so, yeah, I love all that sort of stuff. So Louise Bourgeois, she never grew up. Why would you want to? This horrible object, uh, the Udder Table, by um, the American artist Katie Strout, ghastly. Equally ghastly, Sentient Kitchen examines the convergence between technology and biology. Yeah, why not take advantage of the mammary gland's unique relationship to milk? Um, well, one reason why not is because it's so repellent. Whereas this is beautiful. There's a beaked jug with nipples from the 16th century BC. And here's a weaning bucket. This is for weaning ickle animals from their mother's teat and feeding orphan lambs. The idea has been around for centuries, but this is the latest rubber update. Um, one of the projects I did, um, I managed to shoehorn milk into was um, a book about the strange objects collected by um, Sir Henry Welcome. Uh, by the time Welcome died, he had a collection that was four times larger than the collection of the Louvre. He made so much money because he's the man who invented the pill. You know, before that, you got your medicine in powder form and powders would blow away and they were not practical. But he found that by compressing them tightly into these pills, you could, you know, you could travel the world with a little box of pills and he made an absolute mint. And one of the things he collected was um, nipple shields made of a variety of materials from gold to um, gutta percha, uh, old type of rubber. 
and here's the, the little poem I wrote about them. Nipples are incredible. Babies think they're edible. Tender after being chewed, after being drained of food, the throbbing buds cannot abide abrasion, so they have to hide, withdrawn if only for a spell, like a whelk into its shell. The nipple sleeps, its eyes are sealed, protected by a nipple shield. Yeah, uh, this is not a man breastfeeding. It's actually a woman with a beard. But as I said before, there are instances of men breastfeeding. That same woman was drawn by Goya, in fact, pa painted in Naples, 1640. Uh, yes, strange, strange traditions in Uganda. Until recently, tradition prescribed a very limited diet for its king, with the exception of some sacramental meat. His food was milk and milk alone, carefully chosen milkmen and milkmaids with their faces, chests, and arms whitened with clay, performed the duties connected with serving the king. I'm not sure that sounds like a great gig, being king fed on milk, but who knows. Fountain of Youth by Lucas Cranach. Of course, bathing in milk is supposed to keep you young forever. Wonderful painting. Good God, that's great. Um, yeah, well, will this Volkswagen be kept young forever, bathing in milk? I don't know. Yes, the dialectic is at work here in this very peculiar ad. I can only assume it's a promotional photograph. Two black dolls framing a bottle of very white milk in the snow. This is about as transgressive as anything yet. This is sort of stapled to a phone pole. I mean, I can't decide if this is a fake thing. It's probably fake. You know, bathe in my milk. Offer open to men only. Soy, almond, or traditional. Use my sponge. I will watch you. And here she is watching a willing, you know, that's just such a great photograph. If I ever made another album, that'd be the cover and it would be banned immediately. So black and white is working here. A glass of milk by the artist, David Johnson. I like the fact that he's, that's a glass, but you can't see anything but the rim of it because it's hidden in that black block. He also did this nice thing where the crescent moon is caught in a bucket of milk. And here is a whole boat with milk sloshing in the bottom of the hull, reflecting, who knows, might be the Milky Way. This is a very strange ad. Um, yes, during the Berlin airlift at the end of the war, um, the Douglas Aircraft Corporation had this. And um, yes, in a lecture by Adam Tooze called American Power in the Long 20th Century, he says, a little German girl being bombed with milk cartons. They actually look like glasses of milk to me, but anyway. Um, yeah, bombed with milk cartons by the same people who were bombing her with other things only six to 12 months before. Milk the new weapon of democracy. This was a useful book for me. This is um, by Kenneth Hayes, considers milk as corporate advertising's mustache of health, as the anti-wine, as a complex mixture of fat, protein, corpuscles, lactose, chyle, and plasma that lacks darkness but lacks also the morally pure transparency of crystal and as the luminous middle term between mercury's glare and water's transparency. Nicely put, Kenneth. Milk's turbidity results from a complex mixture. I don't have to read that again. Isn't that the same? Oh, at the very end, milk's unique receptivity to light 
causes it to shine forth as if internally illuminated, as if brightness itself were made fluid. Milk thus shares in the allure of all glowing things. Well, luminous is numinous in most cases, maybe not all, but um, you know, if the, if a substance is glowing from within, like Hitchcock's glass, it's because it is not of the normal world of things. It's numinous. It's invested with a sort of sacred power and has this allure of all glowing things. Yes, examples of artworks where the artist used milk for its opacity to photograph it. Yeah, this is a lovely, this was um, my idea for the t-shirt um, of the M M milk museum that I was setting up. Uh, my very plenty makes me poor. Uh, there's Artemis, poly-breasted. And this idea of the many-breasted goddess is seen in many examples. Rather wonderful drawings. And to end, I want to say it's finished. I want to say I'm done with milk, to get past it as if it were an obstacle in my path. It is. Milk is in my way. I came across it in the course of my development, which was arrested at the point where I fell into it. How to extricate myself? Immersed in it, drunk on it, I experienced the whiteout which Arctic explorers report when blinded in blizzards, disorientated by a sky and ground of uniform opaque whiteness without end, without horizon, without depth. In despair, I drink my ink and write the rest in milk. Where the artist's um, or the writer's portrait usually appears on the fly leaf of my book, um, I use this drawing done by my father in 1951 of me breastfeeding. Um, and I think we'll end there. I'm happy to take questions from the floor. I'm not sure how yeah. to do that technically, but... Uh, well, feel you can put your name in the chat if you have a question or comment. Put and your name can, in the chat. Yeah, and we can... Uh, or you can just unmute yourself. And... Unmute yourself. Great. Yeah, I'm kind of new to this technology. Ready? A thunderous fun. silence emanating from the crowd, which is fine, too. No question. Hmm. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, it's been fun. Um, and thank you all for coming. And thank you, Ben, for inviting me. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it was great, great lecture. And it had all oh. the pictures that are not in the book, right? Yeah, well, you know, this is the first, the first book I've done that had no images. I mean, I think there are three images in the book, old photographs. But um, when I first began talking to the publisher about it, I was sending him, yeah, these drawings. And he was saying, well, you know what? I think the text is much more powerful and mysterious if you just present the text as an object unto itself and don't, um, yeah, don't distract from it with visual material. You know, I always love the symbiosis between image and text. And my whole life, that's what I've been exploring with great enjoyment. But I think he, he had a good point. The book is more of a kind of coherent object just made of words. But there could be a supplement, um, you know, of just the image. Yeah. Yeah, you have to buy both. Yeah. You have to buy both, exactly. Yeah. No, oh, they're a great collection of images. So you, but you were collecting both all along, right? Where I was, I was. And what you've seen here today is a tiny tip of the iceberg of milk imagery. Yeah. Are you going to do a second book? Book Milk 2 with pictures? Well, that's what we were just joking about. I mean, you know, possibly. I mean, a book that's all images that would be a companion to the book that's all text makes sense. Might do, yeah. Well, yeah, because 
You just showed us a fraction of both your picture files from 50 years and the, and the book is a fraction of your written quotes. So yeah, yeah, no, that's true. They, they, why not? Yeah, I need okay. another glass of milk. Yeah, have another glass. <laughs> yeah, there's a, Thank you, a Peter. question by Tom uh, Motley. Okay. Could you, could you tell us something about the London Institute of Pataphysics? Right. Um, it was founded, uh, gosh, uh, sometime in the 90s, I think, by the late Alistair Brocci um, and various friends of his. Uh, he, he died last year, tragically young. Um, but it's, um, you know, I remember being very touched when he said, well, basically it was an excuse to get my friends to come together. Um, you know, he, he had a very wide circle of eccentric and interesting friends who hadn't met each other. And um, we were all sympathetic to Alfred Jarry's science of imaginary solutions, pataphysics. Um, we don't, we love reading Alfred Jarry's books and things. And so that was a kind of a thing that bound us together. And yes, he, Alistair would uh, devise uh, themes uh, which would kind of justify our renting a space and uh, everybody getting together and getting uproariously drunk and giving lectures. And I mean, it was, it was a fabulous thing while it lasted. And I don't mean to make it sound like it too has died because Alistair dying does not mean that the London Institute of Pataphysics is dead, but um, it's going to take a while to recover from that blow. But there must be, I don't know, 80 or 90 members and they come from a wide variety of disciplines, writers, painters, uh, uh, filmmakers. Um, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be part of, uh, let alone to be president of. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I answered that question terribly well or how much you wanted to know about pataphysics, but you can look it up online. <laughs> right. I think Michael Dooley <clears throat> had a comment about uh, a panel in Leviathan with the caption, what this house needs is milk. You oh yeah, that panel? That's, yeah, that was a very old uh, Leviathan strip. That was the cartoon strip I did in I don't know, nine, yeah, nineteen ninety to two thousand, I think. And um, yes, uh, the whole house was was being breastfed, not breastfed. It was, yeah, it was inspired by the things that came through the mail slot, as if that was feeding the house. Somebody else is talking in the background. Yeah. But yeah, the theme of milk, I, I managed to fit that into a number of the Leviathan strips. Anybody who has done a weekly cartoon strip for a lengthy period of time will know your desperation in coming up with an idea week for week. So yeah, I used everything I could find and milk came up into several of them. Pete, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, it's Frank Whipple. I had a question about, um, you know, when you mentioned... Hi, Frank. About... Hi, how are you doing? Um, the mo mention of, was it Beauchelard or the... the yeah, um, Gaston Beauchelard. Yeah. Where, where the uh, the object brings about its its opposite as well, sort of in encloses that or contains yeah. it. Yeah. It got me thinking about the... Um, there was an aspect of Anthony Burgess's novel, as well as the film with uh, that Kubrick did, Clockwork Orange. Right. These guys, these droogs, Alex and his droogs, are always meeting up at the milk bar. Yeah, which has That's this right. sort of ominous countenance uh, there with the, um, like they're there as if it's some real weird subversive, you know, absolutely per yeah. pervert place. But it's it's the milk bar with these very yeah. stylized, sexualized women. And yeah. the breasts were used as like a beer taps almost. It, very strange right. kind of, uh, you know, and that has this sort of contradictory nature to it with this 
they're plotting their malevolence each night at the milk bar. It's really strange, as yeah. the whole thing is, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I think it was a hallucinogenic drug as well, wasn't it? Right. I mean, it wasn't just yeah, milk, that, yes. Yeah, that milk, yeah, it was not an innocent milk uh, associated <laughs> with uh, infancy and innocence. It was definitely a transgressive beverage. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. I have on my shelf somewhere, I have the Penguin paperback edition with a wonderful photograph of a glass of milk. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you. Uh, thank the... you. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, look, I can see Zoe Brigley up there. Hi, Zoe. Hi, I'm so glad to see you. I'm so excited <laughs> about this book. I can't wait to read it. It sounds amazing. Uh, yeah. 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 And I was going to say to you, I'm so interested in this idea of um, the Cento. And I'm so yeah. glad you did this. It's just wonderful. And oh, very good. inspiring, very inspiring altogether. Uh, makes me feel like I'm back in class with you. And I, I just right. feel so so energized and excited by it. But I wondered if you could say something about that kind of balance when you're kind of taking text and it's kind of um, the original speaker and you speaking at the same time and it has that doubleness, which is so interesting. Yeah. Um, and if you had any advice for like people who want to kind of do this kind of work of, of how to go about it and and how you went about it and I know for you it was like a gathering and I remember in class years ago you talking about milk so I was like oh this is so wonderful I'm just so excited yeah well thanks um I you know I would be the last person to be able to give um useful advice because I, I proceeded by a kind of uh idleness you know um I think I did. I already say that most of these quotes were collected by chance. I just came upon them in the course of my general reading, and and because they were found by chance, the quotes themselves had this oracular mystique to them. It was like, it was like a real find. I would get breathless with excitement if in the hmm. you know on page four hundred, the the author mentions milk in some way that I hadn't thought of milk before, and I could add it to the hoard. Um, but, you know, if you, I, I hate to say it again, um, if you Google Cento, you'll find wonderful examples and the whole history, which goes back many centuries. I think it was used, um, you know, particularly when the Christians were trying to um, uh, overthrow paganism, they would take pagan poetry or myths and they would use familiar phrases from the, from the pagan religions and combine them to celebrate Jesus, you know, so that it was a sort of more palatable way of swallowing the new myth. Um, but if you, like me, find writing terribly intimidating, uh, using other people's words is a wonderful escape from that particular anxiety. Um, the book that inspired me in this regard is called Reality Hunger by David Shields. And um, in this book, which is a kind of manifesto, the whole book is just made up entirely of quotes by other writers, and they are numbered just like mine. Um, and in the back there's an appendix where the sources are given and he says you know I wouldn't have included that but the publisher's lawyers insisted I had to um, but personally I love that apparatus I love that um, you know you're reading these quotes you don't know where they come from there might be centuries separating them but they're all in the contemporary now as you're reading um, but then you can sort of flip to the back and read, oh, th that was written by so-and-so. And yeah, it's sort of, it's an interesting way of expanding the territory of the poem. Oh, that's amazing, thank you. And I just feel like um, the playfulness of it feels very freeing. 
And so good. good. Yeah. I can't work without a healthy dollop of play. I just can't do it. I tried to. It's because I didn't grow up, goddamn. Love that. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. That was wonderful, Peter. This is Jonathan Skinner from uh Hi, John. Hey. Yeah, great. That was brilliant and loved it. Um, I was just wondering if you, obviously you, you must have, uh, in, in your archive, there must be Maurice Sendak's In the Night Kitchen. Do you know Absolutely. that book? Yeah, yeah. I'm in the milk, I'm in and, the the milk in and the milk's in me. Yeah, exactly. I couldn't yeah. help thinking of that. Anyways, yeah, that's it was great. I, I just, I hope this recording would be, I, I gathered this was recorded. I know so yeah. many people would have enjoyed this presentation. I don't know if it'll be made available. But yeah. It would be yeah, it'll yeah. be up on the YouTube channel for the comic symposium. Great. If if Peter lets us do that. So if my I'll have thanks. to talk to my lawyers about right. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Anyways, it was wonderful. Yeah. Nice to hear you again, Jonathan. Yeah, good to hear you. Thanks. But Jonathan, you bring up a, a good point about this project is that you know, Peter, you may have exercised your obsession through making this book, but you, everyone who reads this book, I feel like will have it from then on in their <laughs> life and see these references. I mean, even yesterday, I was seeing, you know, I knew that this was happening and I was seeing references and Pinter yep. uh, milk That's and <laughs> it was just like, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's, it's dangerous. It's contagious. And of course, now that the book's been published, I wouldn't say I'm deluged with fan mail, but I have received, you know, four or five um, very nice uh, communiques from people to say, are you aware of so-and-so? You know, sometimes really long things about, about milk, usually in a kind of ecclesiastical, a religious, uh, a Christian kind of sense. Yeah, either either Hindu or Christian. They're both very big on milk. Yeah, and I, I kind of don't like it when it gets too religious. I like I like it if it's mystical, but I don't like it if it's religious, if there's a difference. Anyway. Have you received any vegan protest mail? Uh. <laughs> um people do ask me if I drink the stuff myself. I'm not vegan, but I don't like milk, except in coffee and tea. And when I was a baby, depicted by my father there, I was actually allergic to it. So I think I gave my parents a very difficult time for the first year or two of my life, because they think the only way of making him shut up is by feeding him more milk. But that's what was making me scream. Yeah, th probably the next step is to go into intensive psychotherapy. Hmm. <laughs> There's a question from Insidio. Uh, do you think the quotations could be combined in a different way? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's no end to it. I mean, there is an end to it. I mean... It's very versatile. and You could make a constraint where, you know, you were only allowed 30 quotes, but you had to write, you know, 30 different poems with the 30 quotes and you could do it. Somebody the other day, yeah, again, you know, it's not about milk, but somebody read read this book. Oh, it was my, my dear friend, Alan Hollinghurst. He, he said... Are you aware of this book called um, uh, Let Me Tell You, I think it's called, uh, which is made up, in the whole book is made up of the only the words spoken by, um, oh God, what is her name, who drowns in Hamlet, Hamlet, what's her name? Ophelia. Yeah, so Ophelia doesn't have much to say in the play, but there's enough words that this guy's written an entire novel in Ophelia's voice, which covers the whole story of her life. And I think he's even written a sequel to it. So yeah, sometimes less can be more, you know. It's it's a and it's very liberating if, as I said, like me, you're 
tremendously intimidated by the limitless scope of language. <laughs> you know, try limiting it, then you'd find it sort of little a little easier. Oh, I can see Jody there now. Now you have a halo over your head, but I think you have to. Um, yeah, there you go. I can I've hear you. I've been working towards that my entire life. Peter. <laughs> You'll get. Uh, there. Do you remember Peter, Crazy Joe Bellasara, our mutual acquaintance? Yeah. The guy who had like the, that insane crusade, a what, world what? without milk. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, not to, yeah. Oh, what, was he a New York character or somebody you communicated with in Kentucky? He was, uh, he was a friend, an occupant of the clubhouse for a oh, while, the right. club usuals place. Right. But he also, he lived upstate. No fingers. And uh, yeah, he had his fingers shot off in Vietnam and somehow then dedicated the rest of his life to eradicating milk on the face of the planet. That's and he wonderful. was crazy. Oh, Cute and dangerous. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good old days. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was there was a guy in London too, very famous, who thought protein was going to lead you to, into Satan's clutches, and he was <laughs> he wore a sandwich board and he walked up and down on Tottenham Court Road, saying, you know, avoid protein, specifically milk. You know, so. I, I'm not sure that they don't have a point, these people. You know, when you look at that that image of the man lying underneath the cow, you think, you know, why do we go on drinking this stuff? <laughs> poison, pure poison, Peter. Pure poison, yeah. All right, you guys. Thank you know. You. Here it's way past my bedtime, and I think I'm going to have to go to bed. So I can just say thank you very much for all of your comments and attending this thing. Thank right. you. Thank we you as well. Again. Don't know it where. Was wonderful don't know seeing where. you, Peter. <laughs> thank you, Peter. Let's do it again sometime. Thanks, yeah. Ben, for inviting Thank me. you, Peter. Uh, thank you, Peter. Peter. Ciao. Bye. Bye. Hi, Peter. Thanks. Bye-bye.